Hello, my front porch friend. I have something for you today. But first, I want to welcome you to the back porch. You know, most of the time here, you and I are always hanging out on the front porch or over here by the creek somewhere or up there at those bluffs way up in there or out there in those woods somewhere where you and I usually can be found. But today, it's been raining and storming pretty much all day with more to come. So today, I just decided I would invite you into a place that I actually hang out quite a bit, especially early in the mornings. And there was someone else that was really excited about you being here. Mm -hmm. This is actually Palmer's house. Now, not many people get to be invited into here. And as you can see, that's his bed where he loves to hang out and take afternoon naps. And then over here, of course, is his dining room where he has dinner every night. So it's a little messy back here, but we ain't gonna worry about it. I have a word for you. I wanna to talk to somebody today who's dealing with something that's bigger than you are, stronger than you are, a giant. Maybe a physical giant, it could be a financial giant. It could be something that feels like a, a, a giant that has, even over these past few days, just attacked your family with strife and an attempt at division. Maybe it's between your children or you and your spouse, or you and your children. And you have just felt like over these past few days, I do not know what to do. Our nation is facing a giant right now. No, not just one, giants, plural, many. Really, it doesn't matter what nation you're watching this from, it would be true of yours too, because even though what appears to be uh, a war, because we are at war. I told you that on a video I sent you day before yesterday called, Let's Do Something. I hope you watch it. Yes, we are at war. But even though it appears to be, and it disguises itself as a uh, political or a cultural war, it's actually a spiritual war. Mm -hmm. A spiritual war between the people of God and Satan himself. But I believe today, the Lord, in his word, has given us the strategies, the answers. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? Oh, that has every answer to every question we have and every need that we'll ever have. Not only he's given us his word, but he has given us all the weapons we need to bring down any giant that we are facing. And that's a fact. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of things today. It's so important. It starts off in Numbers, the 13th chapter. It's amazing. You should go read it, the whole chapter. So many lessons for us. It's a timeless story. It's the children of Israel. They just left Egypt. They just experienced all the plagues that God sent on Egypt as he just manifested his power. They just crossed the Red Sea. So they know, Israel knows there's a God. Now then, here they are. They're just at the edge of their land of promise. And you can hear in chapters 13, uh, it's almost like the excitement of God. It's like the Lord just, he, he's just so thrilled to be able to tell Moses, Moses, go pick out 12 men to go explore the land. He says, it's the land that I promised their ancestors, of course, which was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he had promised Abraham, you're going to have a land of your own. And here it is. It's Moses's, it's, it's Abraham's children, his great-grandchildren, all the way through like God had promised. So here he's saying, go, go out there and just look at the land that I've set aside for you. Pick a man from each tribe of Israel. So Moses does that. Twelve men go scout the land. Go out there to look. And the Bible says that they came back with grapes. Just one cluster of grapes that was so big, it took two men to carry the grapes on their shoulders. And so they get back. Oh, they've been scouting the land. They're excited. Well, they were supposed to be excited. And so they're talking to Moses and all the children of Israel. And I want you to note what they've said to Moses and the children of Israel. In chapter 13, starting with, let's just say, verse 27, okay? I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and it says this. 
It says this was their report to Moses. We entered the land that you sent us to explore. It's indeed a bountiful country. They said here, they said it's just flowing with milk and honey. And here's the kind of fruit it produces. But, notice that little word right there, but. You know, it just seems like those buts always get in the way right there. Mm -hmm. But the people there are powerful. And their towns are large and fortified. And we even saw giants there. Look at there. We even saw giants there. The Amalekites that live in Negev and Hight and all the, the Canaanites live along the coast. And then look here. But Caleb tries to quiet the people. And Caleb stands up before Moses and before the children of Israel. And Caleb shouts, we can go at once to take this land. We can certainly conquer it. But, here it is again. But the other men that explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. Now I want you to notice this sentence. They are stronger than we are. That sentence right there was pretty much their doom. They are stronger than we are. Then they begin to spread this bad report about the land. The land we travel through and explored will devour anybody who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. And next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Next to them, we we, we looked like grasshoppers. We felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought about us too. Because it's what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is what the, your enemy is going to think about you too. Because how you think about yourself is what you project to everybody around you, including your enemies. God was so angry with the children of Israel. It, it goes on. It just goes on. Look, even in chapter 14, if you go, you just need to go read it. I don't have time to tell it all to you. In the, in the chapter 14, they are crying. The Bible says they cried all night. Their voices, look at this sentence. They were crying. The children of Israel, when those men said that, the children of Israel went to saying, oh, that we just died in Egypt and just, and, and just, or even here in the wilderness. And then, then they said, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us to die in battle? Our wives and our little ones are going to be carried off. What did have been better for us just to return to Egypt? In verse four, it says, they plotted among themselves and said, let's just choose a new leader and go back back to Egypt. Unbelievable. The Bible says that God was so angry with them. In fact, look what, look at this sentence right here. Look what God says to Moses. The Bible says, well, Joshua and Caleb, you know, they jump in and they're like, no, 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 we can go do this. He says, we can go safely. We can take this land. Don't be afraid of the people of the land. Caleb says, they only help us pray to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the Lord says to Moses, look at this sentence. How long will these people treat me with such contempt? Watch, 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 watch. Will they never believe me even after all the miracles that I've done for them? Whoa. God said to Moses, will they never believe me after all I have done for them? And God was so angry with the children of Israel. He told Moses, he said, you know what? I'm going to kill them all. And I'm going to make of you a great nation, Moses. Moses, I'm going to make you a great nation that's even stronger than they are. And then Moses, of course, stands in the gap, pleads for the children of Israel. And then God says to Moses, he says, okay. He says, I will spare them because you prayed. Whoa. Interesting. Intercessors. Intercessors, do you notice that? God, God changed his mind again because there was an intercessor even though they deserve judgment. And that's what Moses, go read it. Just go read it. Chapter 14, Moses just pleads with God and appeals to his mercy that he knew would triumph over his judgment. And then what did God say? Moses, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. But then God spoke up and said, I will spare their lives. I'm going to do what you asked me to do, not kill them all. But none of them will go into the manifestation of my promise. None of them will go into the land of Canaan, except for Joshua and Caleb and you, Moses. That's it. 
none of them will go in. And it's so it's a little bit scary because of their unbelief what happened. The Bible says, whoa, look at this, look at this verse. This verse always kind of, whoa, made me put the fear of the Lord in you. God said to the children of Israel, because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sin. And then look at this sentence. Then you will discover what it is like to have me for an enemy. Whoa. Did you get that? You will discover what it's like to have me. For, I don't ever want to discover what it's like for me to have God as my enemy. No, thank you. This is what I heard for us today out of this word. James, the first chapter, the second verse, says, when you face trouble, we're going to put the word giants in there. When you face trouble, when you face persecution, when you face something that is bigger than you are, stronger than you are, James said, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Because he says then the testing of your faith will work endurance. And when endurance is matured and has a chance to grow, you'll be perfect and complete, wanting nothing. James said, when you face a giant, look at that giant and go, oh, 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 oh this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. You don't freak out with fear. James said, James 1, verse 2, when you face trouble, when you face something bigger than you, consider it an opportunity. Ah. This, those children of Israel should have scouted that land, and every time they looked at a giant, they should have said, oh, there's an opportunity for God. Oh, look over there, there's another giant. Oh, there's a whole city of giants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're like little grasshoppers in their side. That's even better. Look at us. We're like little bitty. They're huge. What an opportunity for God. Oh, this is going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should have walked through that land, and everywhere they went, they should have looked around going, whoo. What an opportunity for God to get great glory. Oh, that's what they should have done. And that's what you and I have to do. And that's what David did. In 1 Samuel, you got to look at this. David, now the children of Israel, yeah, they didn't know it, but those, those 40 days out there of scouting land was a big 40-day test that they failed. What you're dealing with right now is actually a test. Don't fail the test, honey. Don't, don't fail the test. It's just a test. It's going to pass. You're going to get on the other side of this thing. And when you get to the other side of this thing that you're dealing with right now, make sure you're on the side with Joshua and Caleb and not over there with the children of Israel. You don't want to find out what they had to learn the hard way. Please. Me and you both are going to be over there with Joshua and Caleb. Yes, we are. Don't get me going. First Samuel. I love this story because this is another opportunity. And David took it. And David, the Bible says, you know the story. Go read the whole thing too. First Samuel, the whole chapter 17. The Bible says that David was over here. You know him. Over there in the sheep field with his, uh, taking care of his daddy's sheep. And the Bible says that, that Goliath the Philistine is over there with the children of Israel. And the Bible says, and I thought this was interesting, that the Bible says for 40 days, Goliath taunted the children of Israel and mocked them. I just think that was fascinating. Because I've never noticed that until today. 40 days, Goliath taunts the children of Israel until David stands up. And it's similar to a 40-day period I looked at over here, isn't it? The children of Israel, those 12 spies, a 40-day trial, they were scouting the land, and they failed their test. It's like God's come back around again. It's the 40th day again to see what Israel's going to do with another test. Only this time, David's daddy has come out to the pasture and he said, David, I need you to go over here to the uh, battlefield and take some bread and cheese to your brothers. So David was pretty excited about that and he gets over there to the battlefield. And David's giving his brothers his lunch, getting out the cheese, getting out the bread and everything. And when he does, he hears this, this, uh, this big old giant over here mocking the children of Israel. And if you can read it for yourself, the Bible says that David speaks up. And David says in verse 26 of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, who is this pagan Philistine that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? I just feel like that right now in America. Yes, I do in many ways. And then look what happens. David's oldest brother. Here's what David is saying. 
And the Bible says in verse 28 that his oldest brother said, David, what are you doing around here anyway? What about those few, those few sheep uh -huh, that you're supposed to be taking care of, David? Hey, David, he said, watch. He says it right here. I'm reading it. He says, I know your pride and your deceit. You just want to see the battle. And I love what David said right here. Oh, in the King James Version, David looks at his older brother, and this is his answer to him. In the King James Version of the Bible, David looks at his brother, and he says, what have I done? Is there not a cause here? I just feel like shouting that to the church right now where the, the enemy is just taunting the people of God. And we need some intercessors. We need some front porch friends to be willing to stand up and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? And whenever you're mocked and misunderstood by your family, and when people at the church sometimes are standing up saying, oh, who do you think you are? Y'all and your few little sheep over there. Y'all and your little bitty bunch where the enemy is just trying to intimidate you and make you feel small and nothing. And when sometimes even your family members or when sometimes even your church members will look at you and say, oh, I know your pride. I know what you're doing over there, trying to just stir up something. You know, you just need to stay in your place over there. You need to stand up like David and go, Whoa, 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 whoa. Is there not a cause? Is there not a generation that's being slaughtered by this enemy? You better believe there's a cause. And I love what David did next. The Bible says that uh -huh, King Saul mm -hmm, overhears what David is saying. And he has him brought to him. Yeah. And so the Bible says in verse 32, I love what he said. The, David says to King Saul, don't you worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. King Saul says, that's ridiculous. You're just a young boy. You don't even have any experience in this. And I love what David says. Oh, David says, yeah. One time when I was out there taking care of my daddy's sheep, a bear came up and took one of his sheep. And I grabbed hold of that bear and I grabbed that sheep out of his mouth and I slew the bear. And then another time David said, a lion came out and he took one of my dad's sheep. And I got over there and I destroyed that lion. I grabbed that sheep out of his mouth and I killed the lion. And King Saul, this giant, this Goliath, he'll be just the same as one of those, that bear and that lion. This, he said, oh, I love this. In verse, in verse 37, David said, the Lord who rescued me from the bear and from the lion will rescue me from this Philistine. Hallelujah. What does that say to me and you? It says to me and you, every battle that we fought up to this point had a purpose in it. Everything, every lion you and I have fought, every bear that we've already destroyed, we can look back and say, you know what? This just giant over our nation, this giant that's trying to taunt my family and my health and my children, it looks big. But the same God that destroyed the bear in my past and already gave me victory over the lion will be the same God that gives me victory over this giant. The Bible says that David goes and he gets, mm -hmm, he gets on, uh, Saul says, well, you're going to have to wear my armor. So he puts on David, Saul, David puts on Saul's armor and he goes, I can't wear this. I can't, wear. he comes clinking out with a big old, with big old armor on that's way too big for him. It doesn't fit David. And I love what David said. David comes clinging out with all that, that, you know, rattling everything of his arm. He says, I can't wear this. I've not proven this. This is not what delivered me in the past. This is not going to work, Saul. This may be what you use, but this ain't going to work for me. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to use what I've already proven. Oh, <laughs> come on, sweetheart. You can't, do, you can't do what somebody else has done for their victory. You're going to have to use what you've already proven. That's right. And the Bible says he went to the brook and he found five smooth stones and he put them in his pocket. Whoa. And he has a slingshot in his back pocket. And David heads out to face the giant. And when it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and when he gets out there to the field, the Bible says the giant looks at him and he begins to mock because that's what giants do. If, if, if the devil can't get through to you through your family, if the devil can't get you intimidated by your family, because sometimes even your family or your friends or your church or the office people or the people you work with at the hospital or the school, they'll try to mock you and intimidate you and make you feel like, you know, what are you thinking being out here? And if the devil can't get to you through them, he'll use the giant itself. And the Bible says that that giant looks here and he starts sneering. Mm -hmm. 
verse, thir- verse 42, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. He, the giant said, am I a dog? Am I a dog? He roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his God. And then he said this to David, come over here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And look at this. Oh, hallelujah. I just feel like before I even tell you what David said, my, 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 I feel like some of you right now have been facing the taunting of a giant. I know I have been. I feel like some of you right now have been facing his voice that's just mocking what you believe. Some of you right now have been hearing a voice saying, who do you think you are? You're too young or you're too old to do anything for God. Who do you think you are? You're not qualified. Have I ever heard that one? You're not qualified to lead a four-year university. (laughs) Who do you think you are? You're too young. You're too ignorant. You're not educated. Who do you think you are? (laughs) You don't have no money. You don't have enough money. You're not rich. You didn't come from a rich family. You're not, you, who, what do you think you're doing? What a fool you are to think that you can see your family restored. What a fool you are that you think you can see your family healed, your prodigal brought back, that your prodigal's mine. What a fool you are to think that you can get them back. What a fool you are to think that your body can be healed. Have you heard what the doctor said? Didn't you see that report? What a fool. Do you know what you look like still believing? What a fool. You're outdated. You're old-fashioned and you're too religious. Now you can let you can if you if you if you're not careful, you can listen to those voices and start believing them and be shut down in everything God has intended for you to, to do and to be for him. I know I've heard that voice. I've heard that voice telling me, what a fool you are to think you can build dorms for young people and a campground for young people called Camp Ramp. I've heard that voice telling me lately, what a fool you are to think that you can take an old shopping center and transform it to a production center for young people to be trained and equipped in their their talents and and an auditorium to see 2,000 young people. What a fool. What do you think you're carrying? You You don't have enough money to do that. What do you think? You're too old. How old are you, Karen? I've heard all that just like you. But I tell you right now, I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind today. And I want you to make up your mind with me. Come on, whenever this culture is looking at us saying, oh, what fools you are. We're bigger than you. This spirit over your nation is stronger than you are. Then we're going to have to stand up just like David did. And I'm going to read you what David said to Goliath because it's what me and you are saying to Goliath. It's what me and you are saying to this giant right now. We are saying it together. You come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. You come at me with your mockery. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. And today the Lord will conquer you. The Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world is going to know that there is a God in Israel. And then everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. The Bible says that when he said that, David took off running toward the giant. And the giant took off running toward him. And David didn't turn around and run in fear because that thing coming toward him was bigger than he was. David just kept running toward the giant. Why? Because he knew even though that thing is bigger than I am, it's not bigger than my God. Come on. It's not bigger than the God I serve. And don't you know from heaven, all of heaven must have been looking down, cheering David on, going, come on, David. Come on, David. And the Bible says he reaches back. He grabs his little stone and his slingshot. And with one, with one stone... He hurls that slingshot and 
boom, that, that stone goes directly into the head of the giant and the giant falls face first and David experiences a tremendous victory for all of Israel. And you better believe all the world knew there is a God. And today, all the world, your family, your office, your city, and our nation is going to know there is a God. If we will pass the test that we're in right now of facing something that is bigger than we are, but we can't look at that and think, oh, we're just little bitty grasshoppers and just cower down to their mockery. Come on, and their contempt for us. We've got to rise up with the same faith that David did, the same word. Come on, we've got God's word. We've got 2 Corinthians 3.10 that says the weapons of our warfare. I love it because... The Bible says that David cut off Goliath's head and he had no sword with him. That's why I'm saying he, David had no sword with him. You know what he had? The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. David had his weapons. What was it? A little rock. What is a rock against a giant? Nothing unless God is in the rock. Come on, sweetheart. What you've got is nothing up against your enemy unless God is with you. Come on, I'm going to call that rock praise. I'm going to call that rock the name of Jesus. I'm going to call that rock the word of God. I'm going to call that rock fasting. I'm going to call that rock prayer. Come on, you've got everything you need right now to live in absolute victory over any enemy that you face. Father, strengthen my friend in faith. I declare in Jesus' name that this giant is coming down over her family, over her children, over her siblings, over her, between her relationship with her and her children, and my brother too, for that matter, and his family. Father, in Jesus' name, we declare order to our families, order to this nation. Over America, I pray right now, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let your truth prevail and let your will prevail and let your kingdom come over this nation, God. We come at these things, not in our own strength, but in the name of the God of Israel. In Jesus' name, my sweet friend, will you comment below? Let me know. Let me know what God is speaking to you right now. Would you just comment below? I want you to, to just maybe even tell me right now the name of the giant you're facing. Maybe it's a financial giant. Maybe it's a spiritual giant. But I want you to declare over me, over, over in the comments, I want you to put... I, the, my giant's name is, and you can tell me, or, or you can put, I've been facing a giant of strife in my family. Say this, but I'm coming at it in the name of the Lord. And you can even list whatever the names of your rocks are. Will you do that, sweetheart? Oh, I love you. I'm so over my time. I just, I guess I just talk too much, don't I? <laughs> I love you, honey. I look forward to talking with you next week, and I can't wait to go read your comments and see what God's saying to you too. Till then keep fighting. I'll see you. We're going to see a great victory in Jesus' name.